of worship as printed in your bulletin. We are the church, the community of faith that has been created by the love of God. We, we are, are the people who have been set free by the word of forgiveness in Jesus Christ. Yet we do not come here to parade our own goodness, but to praise the holiness of God. We, we come not to boast of what we have done, but proclaim the redeeming work of Jesus Christ and to sense the movement of God's Spirit. With all our being, we will praise you, O God. We will tell of your kindness and love. Amen. And our hymn of praise this morning is Rejoice, You Pure in Heart, number 15 in the red and only hymnal. <laughs> <laughs> Let's rise and sing.
And you may be seated, friends. Good morning, one and all. It is February the 12th. It is the sixth Sunday after Epiphany. It is the Sunday before Valentine's Day. It is Super Bowl Sunday, not on the liturgical calendar, just saying. <laughs> and it is the day that the Lord has made. So let's rejoice. Let's be glad in it. And let's come together now to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. I welcome you all here into, uh, in our sanctuary this morning. I'd also like to welcome the folks who are joining us online via Facebook Live or who are watching uh, throughout the week on YouTube. It is great to have you all with us. So good that we can be together from wherever we are to worship the Lord with gladness, to rejoice, give thanks, and sing. And let us begin by uh, making the transition from being out there into the world to being here together with one another and with God. Let us lift up our hearts and our voices in prayer and in praising. Will you pray with me now? All glory is unto you, O God, and we praise your holy name. Come to us now in our worship as we seek to open ourselves to your love and your wholeness. Be with us as we set aside our everyday worries and concerns and concentrate on your forgiveness and loving kindness. Create in us today a new sense of meaning and purpose for the living of all of our days in the spirit of the Christ. For it is in his name we pray. Amen. Oh God, we do come here today carrying all the joys and concerns of the week that has just passed, anticipating much that is to come in the days ahead. We come here as a way to get away but, and, and to be in your presence so that we may be strengthened and empowered to truly be disciples of your Son and our Savior, Jesus, who has taught us that when we pray, we should say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. friends. And since uh, we do have a couple of kids with us today, maybe they would like to come down front and join our grown-up kid down here. <laughs> good morning. How are we doing? Good. That's good to see you. Hi there. How are you? <laughs> She's just glad to be here all together. I wanted you guys to come down. See, I'm going to treat you just like you were when you were in pageants years ago. Okay, I got okay. See, I, I find myself looking at you like you're three years old. I know you're older. Anyway, uh, I have a. I wanted to have you come down today because I wanted to talk to you about stories. What 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 is your favorite story to read? What's your favorite book to read? You don't, you don't know exactly? You like them all? Okay, that's fair enough. 
The oh. Magic Treehouse. Yeah, those are, that's a whole series of stories, right? Those are terrific. Um, how about Little Miss Sylvie? What does she? What story does she like to have read to her right now? Um, she likes the book Dada. Likes the book Dada. Okay. <laughs> All right. I know on Facebook you had there was an alphabet book that oh, the teachers yeah. at school sent to you, and she was really loving the alphabet stories. Oh, yeah. See, she's she's. What do you remember from being a little kid? What was your favorite little kid story? I remember this book, oh, what was it called? It was like alphabets, it, like the alphabet letters climbing up a tree. Oh, oh, what was okay. it called? What was I, it called? I can picture it, but I can't think of the name. Chicka Chicka Boom Boom. Oh, it was that one. Chicka Chicka Boom Boom. See, they all speak the same language. As a teacher, uh, as a young adult, as children. You know, well, I have a lot of stories that I like to read. I know when our kids, when Sarah and the boys were little, there were two or three stories that we used to read all the time. There was the spooky old tree. There was um, what was Sarah's? What was more, more, more? Said the more, baby. More, more, more. Said the baby. That's right. <laughs> kids always wanted me to read something about the clown arounds too, but I really hated that. <laughs> <laughs> but I read it anyway because it's so important to read. Well, I have a bunch of, of books here that, that I, I enjoy, have enjoyed reading, and I'm looking forward to reading Sylvie uh, pretty quick. One is a Veggie Tales book. It says, Happy Birthday to You, and it's all about uh, Larry the Cucumber and, and <laughs> Bob the Tomato celebrating. There's Llama Llama Easter Eggs. We've actually read this in the office when I've had Sylvie with me. And, oh, there are two books here I can hardly wait to read. It's Vader's Little Princess <laughs> and Darth Vader and Son. See, I told you I like Star Wars, Chris. What can I tell you? And uh, um, this is, you know, never mind that Darth Vader was an evil villain and who destroyed most of the universe with the Death Star. He was still just a daddy at heart. So, uh, but I like that. But, and there's a whole bunch of other stories. I love Winnie the Pooh stories. I, always, I loved them when I was a little kid, and I love them now. And, oh, there were so many. I like chapter books. Um, there was like, you guys, you guys will know this, the Bobsy Twins. You remember the Bobsy Twins? And uh, there was a series called Brains Benton that was a mystery series. And I thought that was cool because he solved all the mysteries long before the grown-ups did. But I'll tell you what, the best storybook of all, <coughs> right here. This, of course, is the Bible, and, and uh, it is filled with stories. So many stories, I don't think I'll ever have a chance to read them all <clears throat> as many times as I want to read about them. There's a story about Noah and the ark and all the animals that went on two by two. There's a story about Moses leading the people to the promised land and putting his uh, a staff in the air and God parted the Red Sea for him. There's stories about uh, uh, David getting rid of a giant with just a, a rock and a slingshot. And then, of course, there are all the stories of Jesus, of Jesus, how he was born in the table of Bethlehem, how he was baptized in the River Jordan, all the miracles that he did, all the people that he healed, and a story we're going to be telling a lot, and little by little over the next few weeks, the story about how he died and how he rose again. So this, there's so many stories to read. And this, I think, is the best story book of all. And I hope maybe, you know, when we, when we do Sunday school or when you're home, maybe you have a, you know, have a story book at home, look, at, look all over those stories. I think you will find that there's a lot of stuff there that's pretty neat. So, um, so, you know, make sure you read the Darth Vader book. That's very important. That's essential <laughs> reading. But even more so, let's read God's story book, which is the Bible. All right? All right, thank you guys for coming down because I really wanted to talk about reading today. And let's fold our hands and bow our heads. And let's say a prayer today. I'll even give you the words to say. Dear God, Dear God thank, you thank you for all the stories, for all the stories you've, given us you've given us in your holy book. In your holy book. Amen. Well, thank you guys for coming down very much, and we'll see you all later.
I've been reading this book by Mother Teresa, and it's just very short little chapters where she talks about love, prayer, things like that. And one of the things that has been inspiring me is she talks about no matter how tiny the giving, whether it's holding a door or smiling at someone that comes into church or anywhere, that that is a gift you are giving to someone else. When I was 23 and was a full-time organist, I played for a service for a very young man. And young, you don't know anything, and your hands are shaking, and you're upset because you hear the sadness. And I played, and I thought, what difference does it make that I play? And when I was leaving, the widow came up to me, and she said, I want you to know that long after the pain subsides for me, I will always remember the dignity and respect that you brought to my husband's service through your music. Every time I sit here and play, this is like prayer life for me, and I hope that I share and give something to all of you. So if I could say anything today, don't doubt even the tiniest little thing that you do. Don't ever think that that's nothing because it is to the person that you're giving it to. Our scripture this morning is from the book of Mark, chapter 1, verses 29 to 39. My cat was totally unmoved the three times I've read this for him this week, so I'm hoping it will have more of a reaction from you all. 
As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with the fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door, and he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. Thank you so much, Deb, the newest member of our Board of Deacons, newly minted deacon, as I called her yesterday. It, uh, thank you for doing the reading today. Thank you, Susan, for that beautiful piece on the piano. It, uh, um, our prayers go out with a couple of our choir members, uh, uh, Cindy and Deb, both who are dealing with bad colds today. So thank you for jumping in and, and giving us some wonderful music for this service today. All through of this season of Epiphany, we have been looking at a few snapshots of the beginnings of Jesus' public ministry. And as we uh, draw now to the close of the season of Epiphany, it, that ministry is becoming, at least as we read it in Scripture, more and more established, busier, more convoluted. And it just seems fitting that today we should kind of take a look at what happens when things get too busy, when life comes at us. Will you pray with me? Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight. You who are and continue to be today, tomorrow, from season to changing season, from age to age the same, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You know, one thing that continually amazes me in reading the Gospels, and particularly in these past few weeks, as we have been looking at the beginnings of our Lord's public ministry, the thing that amazes me is just how much Jesus is like me. Now, before you all come to the understandable conclusion that my ego is completely out of control, or worse, that the cheese has finally slipped off his cracker, please understand here, I'm not saying I'm like Jesus. I mean, I want to be like Jesus. I aspire in my life to become more like Jesus. I pray that someday, somehow, I might actually be found to be more like Jesus. But no, understand this. I do not believe that I'm in any substantive way holy like Jesus. But I do have to say that the deeper I get into the story of Jesus... All those stories of Jesus that are collected in the four Gospels. I am rediscovering here that Jesus really is kind of a whole lot, in fact, like me. Seriously, now think about this with me for a moment. Last week, you might remember that we talked about how Jesus was tempted. I'm tempted. We read in the Gospels about how right from the very start there were those who rejected Jesus and his message. Hey, there have been more times than I can count in my life when I've been rejected. 
And when Jesus called his first disciples, there was this clear sense that Jesus was asking for help, help to proclaim the good news of his kingdom, to, to go out and fish for people. And trust me here, in just about every endeavor of my life, I need all the help I can get. I guess what I'm saying here is that the deeper I dive into the story of Jesus, who was, to quote a phrase I read online this week, that beautiful intersection of the holy and the human, the more I come to recognize Jesus' humanity in me and in my life. And perhaps at no time more so than in our text for this morning, in which we read Mark's account of what really could best be described as a day in the life of Jesus. Once again, again, this was very early in his ministry. A day that was full and busy and unrelenting, beginning with the healing of Simon's mother-in-law, who was sick in bed with a fever, which led to many others in need who were being brought to him late into the night. As the voice translation of Scripture succinctly puts it, Jesus was kept busy healing people of every sort of ailment, casting out unclean spirits. And even when Jesus manages to slip away to a deserted place in the wee hours of the morning so that he could pray, Simon and Andrew and the others literally managed to hunt him down. That's actually a very close translation to the Greek. They hunt him down so they could tell Jesus that there were still others back there that needed him. So maybe he ought to get back before things really get out of hand. Suffice to say that for Jesus, this was one day that had to have been exhausting. Maybe a bit disorienting and long, long past the point of overwhelming. What becomes very clear in this reading is that Jesus was in a situation in which he could be and very likely was overwhelmed. And I get that. Because I don't know about you, friends, but I know all too well what it is to feel overwhelmed at times. Actually, you know, I'm guessing you do know what I'm talking about here. In the words of the Reverend Dr. James Lamkin, who is a Baptist preacher out of Atlanta, in a world where, he says, it seems as if change is coming at us with an ever greater velocity, we're all just tired, so tired. If you don't believe it, Lamkin goes on to say, just ask anyone anyone at all, how you doing? And just wait for the word overwhelmed. It's like we are not so much living our lives as it is that life is coming at us too fast to handle. To put a finer point on this, you and I end up being so busy, so stressed, our schedules so convoluted, our daily concerns and responsibilities so ever increasing, we become overwhelmed to the point where, if I can quote James Lamkin once again, the decisions we end up making end up as expired as a gallon of two-week-old milk. Ew. But that's how it goes. Truth be told, I've been there any number of times in my life. Times when there was so much around me that needed to be done that I completely lost sight of the moment at hand and of what I should be doing. I don't know why this particular story is always so prominent in my mind, but I think about this a lot. I remember one time back in seminary, it was towards the end of the fall semester, it was Thanksgiving weekend, in fact. And as was our custom in those days, I was out in the woods with my father and the other man at the honey camp in search of some elusive white-tailed deer. But I might as well have been walking aimlessly through the forest because that day all I could think about was the multitude of studying I had to do, 
the term papers that were coming due, the oral exam I had with my Old Testament professor in just a week or two. Friends, suffice to say, what I remember the most about that day is I was literally tramping through the main woods, translating Hebrew texts into English in my head. <laughs> Never mind that I'm in this beautiful place up in northern Maine. Never mind that I am there with my father at one of his and my favorite places in the world. I am just so overwhelmed at this moment, just so filled up with concern, understandably so, but so overwhelmed with stuff that I just couldn't think straight. And I suspect you know about that. For you, it might be all the work that needs to be done, either on the job or at home. Maybe it's all the stress that goes along with, say, raising a family or trying to make ends meet in an uncertain economy. Maybe it's those unresolved feelings of, of grief or anger or regret, the kind of stuff that you wake up in the morning gets into your head and just never seems to completely go away no matter how hard you try. Or could be it's the end result of having read one too many headlines or having seen too much bad news on television or come across the internet. Or maybe it's simply because life in all of its wonder is coming at you with so much speed, so much intensity, that it's become all too much. Too much, all too overwhelming. So it's not just me, I know that. It happens to all of us. If we're human, life is going to involve pressure and stress and tough choices from time to time. <clears throat> The question before us is, it, it always is, what we're going to do about it. How are we going to handle it when life comes at us? And that, dear friends, is why I am very grateful to be reminded in our text for this morning that Deb just read to us. I am grateful to be reminded that Jesus, who is Son of God and Son of Man, who was that beautiful intersection of the holy and the human, is in fact just like me. And by the way, just like you too. Now there's a couple of things that I think we definitely need to take from the story of Jesus' long, busy, and overwhelming day. First of all, it was nothing isolated. It was actually one of the first of a great many busy days that were to come. Here's something I don't really think I had taken note of before, but in Mark's Gospel in particular, there is great emphasis placed on the fast pace of Jesus' ministry. Uh, part of that has to do with the style of Mark in general. It is written uh, to be, it was written soon after the resurrection. It was meant to be almost like a journalistic report, fast and, and with, with no frills. But it also has to do with the tone of, of Jesus' story itself. Biblical scholars point out that in reference to Jesus, Mark's gospel uses the words immediately or at once at least 39 times. 39 times in what is already the shortest in length of the four gospel accounts. What this tells us is that Jesus was always on the move. It was always about being on his father's business, always about spreading the good news of God's kingdom. It is no accident that in our text today, when the disciples find Jesus to bring him back, presumably to Simon's mother-in-law's house, Jesus immediately answers, let's go on to the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also because that's what I came out to do. And immediately, immediately, Jesus and the others pick up and move on to another place. They move on. Now, Having said that, I will confess to you this morning 
that there's something, at least for me, that's a little disconcerting about that. After all, as, as, as is made clear in that passage, there were already people lined up around the corner waiting to be healed. So why couldn't Jesus just have stayed put for a little while longer to get this job done before moving on to the next one? But you see, that wasn't the entirety of Jesus' purpose, and he knew that. It was to tell the good news about the kingdom of God to as many people as he could in as many different places as possible. What we find in Jesus, even in the midst of everything that was going on around him, was a clarity of focus. It was a clarity of focus that comes out of his own understanding of who he was and what was his mission. It was an understanding that had its source and its sustenance in God. Which brings us to the other important thing, amongst many really, but the other important thing that we need to take from this story. That the sustenance of clarity and focus that Jesus received from God, this clarity in knowing how to deal with life as he was living that life, that all came from spending time with God. That is, in fact, a crucial aspect of Jesus' ministry that, that we find throughout the Gospels, that continually we read about how Jesus would withdraw from people, how he would get away from the busyness of his daily activity and the demands of his ministry to be alone with his heavenly Father to pray. There is much in the four Gospels that speaks of solitude and silence and of Jesus needing both for that ministry. In the words of author and pastor Bill Gaultier, this is how Jesus began his ministry. It's how he made important decisions. It's how he dealt with troubling emotions like grief. It's how he dealt with the constant demands of his ministry. It's how he cared for his soul. It's how he taught his disciples. And it's how he prepared for his daily life. And ultimately, it is how he prepared for his death on the cross. And you see, friends, if that's how Jesus, who really was just like you and me, if that's how Jesus was able to face life coming at him with the unrelenting force that it did, how can you and I ever expect to do things in our lives any differently? How could we think, Galtier goes on to say, that we can live well or love well without following Jesus' example? Yes, friends, the point is for us to be more like Jesus. But the good news is that Jesus reminds us again and again and again that he is like us. And so he understands what we face. He knows all the feelings of being overwhelmed by everything that life hurls at us. And he can show us, you see, a way of life, true life, and living that we can get through. And the thing is, it all starts, it begins, and it ends with a relationship with God. And, I might add, some quality time spent in the quiet with God. I mean, I think back of that weekend, I was wandering around the woods worried about studying. How much better off might I have been in doing the work I needed to do if I had just been present in the moment, if I had just breathed in that late autumn, early winter air, if I had just opened my ears to the sounds all around me and recognized God's presence. For that matter, I can think of countless times over the years that I probably would have handled the stress of whatever the situation was so much better if I just stopped to breathe. Never underestimate the power of breathing, particularly if you're breathing with God. The bottom line, you see, is that we can never really stop life from coming at us the way it does. <laughs> you know, I can't tell you the number of times over the years that Lisa and I have looked at each other in moments of stress, concern, or 
let's face it, downright chaos in our lives. And we have said to one another, in fact, I've been saying it to her for years, you know, if we can just get through this, then things will almost certainly calm down. Suffice to say, we're still waiting for that to happen. (laughs) What's true, though, is that in faith and love, things do get better, but they don't always calm down the way we were hoping because, well, that's the way life is. Life comes at it, comes at us. There's no denying it. But the good news in Jesus Christ is that we can attend to the life that God has given us. And we can do it with prayer and in reflection and in the knowledge that with Jesus, we will come to know true peace. We will experience grace and we will find true wisdom for living amidst everything that is hurled at us in this life. There's no getting around it. Life can be exhausting. And it's more than a little overwhelming at times. A whole lot of times, in fact. But you know what? The thing that the prophet Isaiah said, it very much holds true. Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall not faint. There's a lot coming at us in the week ahead. There's a lot coming at us as life unfolds in all of its wonder and its glory and its occasional confusion. In whatever comes at us this week, May it be true for you and I, you and me, that we can wait on the Lord and renew our strength. And as it happens, may our thanks be to God. Amen and amen. And we are going to sing What a Friend We Have in Jesus, and that's hymn 585 in the one and only Red Hymn. 585. Let's stand and sing, friends.
And you may be seated, friends. Take it to the Lord in prayer. That is advice uh, that is offered in infinite love and not nearly heeded as much as it should be. Have we trials and temptation? Do we have too much, an overwhelmingly amount to bear, overwhelmingly great amount to bear? Take it to the Lord. Let us pray unto the Lord, knowing that as we open our hearts, that God will speak to us, that will give us a sense of peace that the world can't give, give us a direction on the pathway ahead, and inspire us to be the people that he has created us to be. As we pray today, I hope that we will keep several members of our uh, uh, extended church family in our prayers today. Uh, We continue to pray for Kathy Radel's sister and George's daughter as she's recovering from surgery and moves on to the next step of her treatment. So for chemo is likely the next step, and so we will pray that the, the appointment with the doctor goes well and that there is a good plan ahead. So our, our best wishes and prayers go with her. We want to continue to play, pray for Jennifer Lynn's family. Uh, her uh, mother, Diana Lynn, passed away. The obituary, I think, ran this morning in the paper. Uh, no word yet as to the service uh, but uh, our prayers go with Jen and Cindy and the rest of the family in this time of loss. We want to uh, uh, say a prayer for Dick Hammond. We understand he's over at Health Services at Havenwood. I think that's where he is. He's at Havenwood. He's at Haven. He's at the lodge as opposed to one of the cottages right now, right? Yes, I yeah. think he's in Health Services. And uh, we'll find out more about that. But, of course, he was dealing with uh, COVID and other things through throughout these uh, winter weeks. And we continue as well to pray for uh, Cynthia Murray as well, who had a fall. She was in and out of the hospital as well. So. And, COVID. and COVID on top of everything else. So we pray for them. Uh, we received word this week, uh, a prayer request from Sue, her cousin, Jerry, uh, underwent a heart procedure and was diagnosed with pulmonary fibrosis, uh, which is something in the family and, and a pretty devastating bit of news. So our prayers go He's with him. Struggling right now. I can imagine why. I mean, as you know, much as you hope that these things won't happen, they sometimes do. So our, our prayers go with him and with all your family. We also continue to pray for our uh, extended family who are uh, folks who are unable to be with us here today, but are with us in spirit and perhaps online too. Uh, folks like Ray Edmonds, Reverend Alden and Carol Ann Blake, Sally Gibbs, Maxine Brewster. By the way, we are in hopes. Uh, We had to discontinue it when the pandemic happened, and it's been one of those things that's been happening in fits and starts at Havenwood, but we are in hopes to resume a uh, monthly service over there for folks in the East Church family. We'll keep you posted on that, so pray for that as well. Are there any other prayer requests this morning? Yes, ma'am. A prayer of praise that Rich is back with us. After yes, this. hallelujah. Yes, it's great to have you back. You, you're looking good. You're feeling better, I trust? 100%. All right. There you go. Thanks. Be- and you're back to work, right? Yes. There you go. And uh, uh, but I just, when you came in today sporting those sunglasses, we're thinking, oh boy, how good it is to see you. <laughs> Not only did you look cool, you looked healthy. That was a, that's even better, so. Thank you, Rich. It's great to have you back. Did I see your hand go up? Um, you did. I'm sure we're all thinking of turkey and Syria. Thank you. I intended to write that down. If you have any advice you can give us for helping, whether Church World Services is the place to give or what, but it's awful to be helpless. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, for, for the, the devastation and the loss of life and everything that's happening in that part of the world. Uh, Church World Service, honestly, is the be- your best bet. And, of course, we have a connection uh, and a link via the, the hunger walks that we do. Um, I have not heard an awful lot through the denominational office about this, but I also know we work in partnership with Church World Service. If I can uh, find specifics, I-, I will send an email out or get it on, on Facebook because 
I know there's a lot of people that definitely want to assist and even uh, to give money so that relief efforts can continue the way they should. Thank you for that. Yes, Kathy. That's right. Yep. Um, yep. This past week, uh, we did the service of committal at the Veteran Cemetery for uh, Terry and Marge. And, you know, those of you who have been through the loss of a loved one and have gone through all of the things that go along with that, the funeral and the committal and everything, know that that is after it's all over. It's when the process of grieving truly begins. And I, uh, uh, I've had the opportunity uh, to be uh, to talk with uh, Jean on a few occasions this week, and they're holding up, but it's a hard time, uh, and it, it's bound to be. So thank you for that. We'll continue to pray for um, the Hool family uh, as they go through this. Anyone else? All right, then, friends. Let us bring these concerns, the prayers of our hearts. Let us open our hearts so that God might enter in as we pray. Will you pray with me now? Loving, eternal, ever-present, ever-caring God, we come to you today bringing everything in our lives. The joys and happiness of, of daily life, the celebrations of, of things that are happening to us and around us, but also the concerns, the struggles, the uncertainties, and, and the things that we can't seem to get rid of on our own, the grief and the anger and the sense of hopelessness. We bring all of these to you, O oh God, knowing that you are with us, so help us in this moment to truly open ourselves unto your, your love and presence, just as Jesus did at that deserted place that we read about today, just as he so often did. Because God, we need your presence. We need your calming. We need that modicum of strength that we have to have for the next few steps along the way. We need your love to help us to remember that we are love beyond any kind of measure. We need your joy so that we can glean the true joy of what all of that which you have to give us. And we need your unending hope to help us to be, to be confident in this walk of life and to do it in step with you. Oh God, we have heard many prayers spoken aloud here today, and we know that there are many prayers that are being lifted up in the hearts of these folks who are gathered in the pews, those who are watching and praying with us online. And we pray that, that what you would offer to us individually, that you would offer to us as families, and as circles of friends, and as, as a community, as a nation, and in the world. But above all, God, we would pray that you would comfort us as your church, that collectively we might get a true sense of your Spirit's presence and your Spirit's leading, but also that you might help us to, to be able to spread that truth and peace and light to one another, to our neighbors here on Mountain Road and outward to the world. May this steeple in this place not simply be a piece of architecture on the side of the road, but may it represent something greater, something healing, something infinite to all those who pass by, for all those who are inspired to come inside. We need your help, O oh God. We need to be with you today, tomorrow, and always. And we ask this in the name of the one who sought first and foremost to be with you in all things, 
Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. God is with us in this place. We are called to be with God, and we are called to serve God to, uh, by giving a portion of our bounty. The morning offering will now be received. give today and grow our hearts so that our offerings may blossom tomorrow. Help us discover the wild, sweet joy in giving that we find in you and in your Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much, and you may be seated. Well, as we come to the close of our worship this morning, a couple of quick announcements. First, uh, today is the second Sunday of the month, and so as become a new tradition here at East Church, we have a mini bake sale happening out in the Fellowship Hall. We got sweets for Valentine's Day. We got soup for Super Bowl Sunday. And, and, or, and we have lots of stuff for lunch and for just a little snack in here today. Uh, so be, please be sure as you come out to enjoy some refreshment and fellowship before you go home today uh, to make use of, uh, of, of the stuff that is there before you. Now this week is going to be uh, 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 kind of interesting. This coming Friday, we're doing something new. We are going to have a East Church game night. Lisa, could I get you to talk a little bit about that? Sure. It's very low key. It's just if you have a favorite game you like to play, bring it with you and maybe we'll have a chance to play it. Maybe we won't. I'm going to bring five or six games to have here. If there are any children that want to come, um, unfortunately, I don't have any children's games right now. So if you do come with a child, make sure you bring a game or two for them. And it's just, like I said, very low key. Where I think I put 630, I think I put six. 
6 to 8 30. 6 to 8 30. I think that's what it is. Come whenever you can. Leave whenever you have to. If you want to bring some snack to share, that's great, but you don't have to. So you can come empty handed, come with a game, come with a game and snack, or just come with a snack, whatever you want to do. We will be here and we will have fun for whoever shows up. Just I, I just warn you right now, you might not want to play cribbage with me because you won't have a chance. So <laughs> Can I tell you something about my lovely wife and her competitiveness? Um, <laughs> Seriously, this is a great opportunity uh, for us just to kind of hang out together. And the middle of the winter, you know, you get into February and you begin to wonder if this strange winter is ever going to end. Sometimes it's just nice to be together and enjoy some, uh, some games and just the fact of being together. We actually hope this is the first of many kind of, of events like this. So, um, as I always say... I hope you come, but I also hope that you take the opportunity maybe to invite somebody uh, to come along. Yeah, a neighbor, a friend, maybe they, somebody who needs to get out and have uh, a time uh, out of the house. So uh, hopefully we'll see you on Friday night, 6 to 8.30 as well. Uh, meeting night uh, here at East Church is this Wednesday. Uh, trustees at 5.30 followed by Council at 6.30, so mark that on your calendars as well. A week from this coming Wednesday, uh, the 22nd of February is Ash Wednesday, and we are planning uh, a Ash Wednesday devotional service and a uh, very simple luncheon. Hope to have maybe some soups uh, available and have if folks want to bring a sandwich to share uh, to, to have be a part of that. We would love to have folks come. We will have a brief service, including the imposition of ashes. I'm also looking, by the way, at an opportunity of maybe having uh, some Wednesday noontime gatherings for reflection and study through the Lenten season. And if you're interested in that, please, uh, please let me know that. And we will have, a, you know, some kind of a light curriculum, nothing too deep, but something enough for us to kind of use the opportunity of, of that journey to the cross for some deepening of our relationship with the Lord. So that's coming up. Finally, too, I've neglected, uh, and my apologies for mentioning this past couple of weeks, uh, the New Hampshire Conference sort of central event of the year, Prepared to Serve, is happening on Saturday, uh, the 25th of February. We have a couple of uh, brochures out on the table out there if you're interested. The early registration has come and gone, but there is still definitely time to, to register uh, to be a part of that event down at Pembroke Academy and uh, so it's nearby uh, it's always very well attended and it's a good chance if you have a lot of friends throughout the conference uh, uh, good chance to see it. also the installation of our new associate conference minister is going to be part of that so uh, check that out as well any other announcements before we close yes Chris uh, I didn't mention it to everybody here you're going to find in the fellowship hall on the tables some pennies with hearts stamped out of the center. They are not decoration. They are for you to take. And if you want to take an extra one or two to give away to somebody, the hearts are because of Valentine's Day. But you see the pennies on the table is also in front and the rear. I've got a few. Please take them. They're for you. And anyone you want to give them to. Very good. If you run out, if they run out, come see me. I got some more. Because every time it rains, it rains pennies from heaven. <laughs> doopa doopa. Thank you, Chris. That was really neat. You uh, you brought the the hearts and the pennies and the crosses and the pennies a couple of weeks back, and and uh, um, good reminder as well for you and to share with others to pass those things on. So thanks, Chris. Anything else? All right, we're going to close with Go My Children. And that, actually, the words are printed in your bulletin to the tune of number 431.
friends, go forth having been fed and nourished by the Lord our God. Go forth serving God in all the places you go with all the people you know. And know that you are never alone no matter how busy or over overwhelming things become. That you are in the presence of the Lord your God. Go in peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Go with peace.